Right now, the de Blasio sideshow moves into the center ring. The do as I say, not as I do moment on the traffic violations turns into something more. After the mayor refuses to answer questions, now he's talking, but has already lost the media less than two months into his administration. If so, how does that impact what the new mayor can do? And next, is he the great Republican hope in the Empire State? Rob Astorino expected to jump into the governor's race soon. We're going to ask our panel, some nodding, some shaking their heads, to describe a path, any path, where he might actually win or at least compete against Governor Cuomo. And later, downsizing the military, can a new plan to reduce the Army to 1930 levels provide the results that the U.S. needs? And is this a political headache in the making for already beleaguered Democrats? Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French and thank you so much for joining us this Monday evening, February 24th. Now, eight weeks, it seems longer, but Bill de Blasio has been the mayor of New York City for just eight weeks. But it has been an easy, busy eight weeks from an ambitious progressive agenda to conflicts with Governor Cuomo and through snowstorm after snowstorm, de Blasio has already been through quite a bit. But the latest de Blasio kerfuffle, Andrew's favorite word, could be the most damaging thus far. And the irony is it began as a rather small thing about traffic safety that just keeps on growing. And for more, let's bring in the aforementioned Andrew Whitman. Rich, red lights and jaywalking and stop signs, that's what this is all about. And that's what it started at all after a series of traffic accidents in January. Mayor de Blasio pushed for a crackdown on road violations in the city. But last week, a TV crew followed de Blasio's motorcade and found it blowing through stop signs, changing lanes without signaling and speeding, all stuff that was included in the de Blasio crackdown. And for good measure, Friday, the Post caught de Blasio jaywalking, crossing against the light, jaywalking also a part of that crackdown. But Friday, the mayor threw gasoline on this fire. First, he essentially blamed his NYPD motorcade for the violations. Then he gave a brief statement and walked out of a press conference, taking no questions. Commissioner Bratton addressed the topic of my security detail earlier today. I'm very comfortable with what Commissioner Bratton said, and I refer you to his comments. Thank you very much. <laughs> That on Friday, no apology, no my bad. Now fast forward to today, after a weekend out of town, de Blasio met the press again, taking just four questions. Again, no apology and no my bad instead. I think too much of the time the debate veers away into, you know, sideshows, but I'm not shocked by that. No one's above the law. Should uh, everyone who works for me and should I uh, follow the law scrupulously? Of course, yes. Uh, if the NYPD in any given instance believes there's a security reason for doing something a certain way, I think that's important to recognize and respect. And that's it on the subject from Mayor de Blasio, Rich. And let's be honest, everybody, in isolation, this is kind of silly, jaywalking, uh, <clears throat> going through red light, but taking it a whole, calling precinct houses personally, uh, checking in the status of uh, friends here, the whole Al Roker mess. You put it all together, and in two months, the questions of not ready for prime time keep coming up again and again. So to get into this and a lot more, let's bring in our panel. Jeannie Zeno here, professor of political science at Iona College, professor of campaign management at NYU. Dominic Carter, political journalist and author. Tom Doherty, always shy. We'll see if we can get him out of his shell tonight. <laughs> Republican strategist and partner at Mercury and a former advisor to New York Governor George Pataki and Andrew Whitman, who you met already, our senior political correspondent. Okay. I know in isolation, like I said, a silly, but you have a honeymoon period, Dominic, and you've covered mayors for a long time. They don't last long to begin with, but when you basically, you know, conduct it the way he has, the knives get uh, sharpened and they get starting to draw out for this guy. If he's got an ambitious agenda, it seems that he does, he's going about it in a funny way. The agenda of the tax cut for a pre-K, that was dead on arrival from day one. Anyone that tells you different, no offense, they don't know what they're talking about, or they don't understand Albany and Governor Cuomo. So that was never gonna happen, and of course it will happen tomorrow, and I'll be proven wrong. Exactly. But, <laughs> can you play the tape? <laughs> yeah, oh, he will, it up. he will. Yeah. But as far as, I see Tom Doherty yeah. tapping uh, <laughs> Andrew over there, but as far, he did squander his goodwill. But these stories are ridiculous. But don't they add up though? When they, they do add, add up. up. And, and one thing I will admit, I've been in City Hall for many more years than I care to admit. And whenever a mayor, I've only seen it happen, I saw it once under Koch, one, once under Giuliani, 
a mayor should never walk out of a news conference and leave questions because then the reporters say to themselves, got you. And then they're waiting for the next conference where they're going to badger you with questions. This one's going to ask this. I'm going to ask the same thing. And we're going to go over and over and over until your head is ready to explode. We've seen it before, but, but it's always when there's... This seems to be almost self-created by this mayor. Yeah, I mean, the term that people are using is an unforced error in several of these cases. You know, he didn't need to walk out of that news conference. As Dominic mentioned, a story that most people say, hey, listen, motorcades always go fast. We've seen it with countless, not only New York City sure. mayors, but governors and everywhere else. People aren't shocked by that. I mean, the hypocrisy is that 48 hours earlier, he made that statement, okay, he should have owned up to it. But to walk out of the news conference is where he made his mistake. When he's been approached by reporters outside his home, he's done the same thing, tried to shut them down. He tried to shut them down basically today. And it's just going to ignite a fire around it. So he's really got to address the questions head on. He could say, basically, I made a mistake. It's not going to happen again. We won't, you know, go fast unless we're going to an emergency. And it would be over with. Same thing with the issue of the snowstorm. Same thing with the issue of calling on behalf of his political supporter. These are all really rookie mistakes. So the problem is for de Blasio, they fit into a narrative that we saw in the campaign, which is he's not ready for prime time. He's That's not ready to lead the city. But... And, and, you know, we should just say almost every mayor and every anybody who's led anything has gone through this. There's a learning curve here. If he simply said, hey, listen, this is where I am and I'll do better next time, this would all of this would probably go away because it's not big stuff. But when you attach it to an agenda as ambitious that he has right now and seemingly they embrace the idea that he's the national spokesman for the progressive movement here, then it gets a little bit more than just silly stories distracting the message. Now, to a guy who's probably been in the motorcades when they're flying through the red lights here, um... Is this a communications problem? Uh, who Does he look to somebody's office to say, why aren't you stopping me when I'm tweeting with Al Roker uh, and lower myself? Or who let me get on the phone uh, to go call some precinct house personally here? Where Where's the problem in this? Isolated, they're not big deals, but put together... Um, they're telling a story I know he doesn't want to be telling right now. I, I think that they always come down to staff. It, it is, do you have a, a, a solid senior staff around you? The, the problem that we've seen in New Jersey, uh, the problem that I think we're seeing in New York right now is always driven by a lack of adults in the room. There were many times as, as a young staffer to the governor, you know, I had a crazy idea. The chief of staff, Brad Race, who was a, uh, a, a colleague of the governor way back, you know, when, when they first left law school, was able to say, are you crazy? <laughs> uh, when the governor would, would, would utter something, he would say, George, he was the only one who could say it privately, George, we're not doing this. Uh, and, and, and the mayor needs to, to, to surround himself with people who, who gets them together, briefs them properly, et cetera, uh, with a game plan. As you pointed out, all of these instances, I mean, the, the times that I flew in the state helicopter with the governor, we made sure the state helicopter never went above the speed limit of a state helicopter. That's up to the state's police job. That's mm -hmm. up to city police job. I mean, we shouldn't be complaining that the, the mayor is blowing through a stop sign. Sure. I, mean, I don't want the mayor of New York going 12 miles an hour. Th that's dangerous for him to do that, quite frankly. Uh, but at the same point, how you react to that, how you answer the questions about it. The only problem that I've seen so far is, is the call to, to, to the yeah. police about the, the reverend, et cetera, et cetera. Th those are the type of things that the average New Yorker says, I can't do that. The average New Yorker doesn't care that the mayor's motorcade is blowing through. In fact, they're impressed when the presidential motorcade blows through. So he needs to surround himself, I think, just with, 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 with better people that I'm sure he has, but they need to be more vocal. They need to be able to and feel how about that they that can trick in that line, like Dom and Jeannie said, about when you answer, when you engage the media, um, you can't always do it on your terms when you're reacting to this. Uh, it seems that they're kind of still finding their way. Look, you, you need to have a thick skin in this. And, and the one thing that I admired most about George Pataki when I worked for him was that he had no ego. Nothing ever, no matter what you said to him, it, it rolled off his back. He left. He, he dealt with the press. You know, I, I worked for him directly for eight years. I never saw him get angry with the media. I never saw him storm off a stage, et cetera. And I think that, look, six months from now, we'll look back on this. We'll have forgotten it. Uh, as Jeannie said, everybody has a learning curve. Mm -hmm. And this is his learning curve. It's a rough one. He'll get over it rather quickly. But he really needs top people around him who are not afraid to tell him the truth. <clears throat> when, when you have yes people around you, that's when it just escalates and you yep. think I can do whatever I want. Somebody has to say, Mayor, Let's sit down, let's take a breath, and, you know, go forward. Now, this Sanders 
kind of the prelim with the big fight, which has nothing to do with the media, although the media will play a role. He's got major union contracts all coming up seemingly at the same time that he's going to negotiate. One way or the other, he's got interesting bedfellows with the universal pre-K tax plan right now. Um, he doesn't need headaches going into either of these fights. They're going to be hard enough as it is. Well, the only way I think that this stuff impacts those debates is if it really dents his popularity, which gives him the mandate that he claims from the election win uh, in entering into any of these negotiations. I, I don't. I think the table is pretty much in agreement. It's probably not going to impact uh, his his numbers. We're probably not going to get numbers on him this early on. So I don't think there's any danger of that happening. The losing the press argument, you could argue could have potential repercussions if it means more negative story cycles for him going forward or more reports like the one where they're tailing him to watch his every move and and see what he's doing he's gonna have to come up with a better media strategy though this is a different political environment for this mayor than it has been for the last two mayors i would argue because of the nature of the of the city and the fact that he's a democrat mm -hmm. in a democratic city but, but easier I just, to snipe. I'm sorry i just disagree if these stories continue we're going to see the chris christie treatment as far as Christie was, his numbers were sky high. Look at his poll numbers now. The but same, it's a much more same, serious allegation. That's true, but the same, but the light. same exact yeah. thing. Because Mayor De Blasio right now is looking like he's not ready for prime time, and it's going to be reflected in I his poll numbers. I think part of the problem is a lot of the media said we didn't vet this guy enough during the campaign, and he kind of came out of nowhere in the back of the pack in the primary. Wasn't did. challenging the general really. And now it's we're learning been, about it on the I've fly. made this point before. To my mind, it's been a self-fulfilling prophecy from the media. There have been all these questions from election day to inauguration day. Is he ready for prime time? Oh, my goodness, he's not ready for prime time. I, I, I do think some of that wears off after a, after a while. Okay. Up next, he may be the great Republican hope in New York's gubernatorial race, but the polls right now say not so much. So what has to happen here for Rob Astorino? who we're expecting to announce his official run for governor as early as this week, if not next year, to become Governor Astorino. We've got the right table to ask that question, too. We'll get into that after this.